I don't know if you can hear me, Ed. Hello? I can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. I, I mentioned to Mark a little bit ago that I, I was going to Ed and logging on, and I'm on a quest in my car searching for a better Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> as as in, often happens around here. But, uh, I thought I'd let you know in case, well, he's coming back now. But okay. Anyways, I'm sure I have plenty of background noise, so I'll join in later. All right. Good luck in your search. It's the eternal quest. We once went looking for the Holy Grail, and now we look for Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> They're indistinguishable from one another. Hello, gentlemen. Wait, Same to you, sir. Let me uh, plug in my ears. All right. Well, we don't have a official topic for today. So I think we're going so, to have to improvise. Wait, wait. So my topic was not accepted by the board of directors? It wasn't even considered. <laughs> <laughs> but by the same token, it wasn't rejected. <laughs> there. It, it was left in it's, state of indeterminate. <laughs> It's just there. <laughs> it, it it may manifest and it may not. Uh, yeah. it, I I can guarantee you it will <laughs> manifest. It will manifest. Huh? It sounded like some kind of astrology without the stars. <laughs> <laughs> no, it it is so unbelievably, and I know we have people paranormal, all that stuff. Yeah. I can present it to you and you will do, I don't know, backflips, no. move to another state, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like some kind of a magic. Would you describe it that it, way? No. No. Not magic. Another... A, I think this site is is trying to get at what is real, what's happening. Is it a supermind? Is it this? Is it that? Hmm. This guy had an idea, and he did research, and. If you Google it, it's like 90% accurate, which is almost unheard of. Google? Google, Google this, is, Google, this, what Google I what? said. What are you talking about? So What I said, the secret language of birthdays. Okay. Which is. What's it based which, on? What's that? What's it based on? Where, where's he coming from? He's coming on, okay, the life cycle, the grand cycle of life, the zodiac, and the premise is that all other mammals are born in the spring. And so they're programmed to behave in a certain way. Hmm. Humans are born throughout the calendar, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. And and you start with sort of like Marco in, in your conversation with Ann Roberts about the Cheyenne and the uh, coming from different points of the compass. Mm -hmm. Well, this guy takes that 
I don't know, to, to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. And in other words, he's saying that there are 365 different personalities, not 12 like Young. With a, 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 you know, we've talked about that. Uh, and his research is pretty amazing in that he takes uh, 50 people, but, but uh, granted, uh, what would you call them, uh, celebrities, where you have access to their personal information. And then he, as a factor analysis, these are the characteristics that a person born on this day exhibits. And like I said, it's like 90% accurate. Uh, and it, his he goes through a lengthy, okay, this is why this is. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, again, if I'm repeating myself, most mammals are born in the spring. Humans can be born anytime. Mm-hmm. So, but he thinks that there is a determinant, uh, determinant factor in if you were born in the spring, summer, fall, winter, then he keeps narrowing it down to the exact day you were born. And then he looks at all these people who were born on that day and comes up with a factor analysis. This is who you are. Mm. And with our current, I've looked at... uh, uh, Anthony Bourdain and uh, Darren Aronsky. It's friggin' amazing. I've looked at Donald Trump. I've looked at uh, uh, Barack Obama, myself, my father. It's pretty friggin' amazing. So that was, you know. What's the guy's name again? The uh, researcher, the psychologist, yeah. Yeah. Goldstein, or like Gold, Gold Schneiderin. You guys didn't Google this? No. Jesus I had, Christ. I, I, I have other things to do with my days. Yeah. I figured you were going to tell me all about it. Well, <laughs> I am. I, I'm well, trying. that's why I'm asking you what the guy's name is. <laughs> I'm trying to. I I wrote it on the, uh, you know, my yeah, thing, know. and nobody cares. Okay, but I'm I'm on the page that would have been for today, and I don't see the guy's name there. That's why I'm no. asking. Well, I did it when I proposed it. Mm. I when I proposed it. Google the secret language of birthdays. Okay. All right. So let me un- let me see if I understand this. Yeah. Good theory, this idea. The idea is that each day of the calendar, I love you, Mark. Five days um, has some kind of an influence on the people who are born on those days. And this has something to do as well with the reproductive cycle of humans, because we're not only born in the springtime in the way that other mammals are. We're born throughout the year. We're able to mate at any time. And so we're born at any time. And so there's a greater diversity in human types than you would find in, let's say, mammalian or other animal types. And so the idea is that each day of the year has its own unique set of characteristics that that are somehow imparted to the uh, child who's born on, on that day, and that they carry forward those characteristics as elements of their personality throughout their lives. And the way that this guy demonstrates this is by looking at um, uh, famous people who, you know, he has data on in the sense of 
um, public displays of their personality that you could kind of chunk into some kind of psychological categories. Like, I don't know what categories he uses, introversion, extroversion, um, conscientiousness. I mean, I know that there are some basic psychological models for personality types. So he has some personality typology, which is rooted in birthday uh, and where, why exactly the birthday, how exactly that works. Maybe that's explained in the book or, or by Google. Astrology, of course, you know, I mentioned it because it sounded very much like astrology. In astrology, there's a theory behind the uh, influences that are described, right? It's because the stars are in some kind of alignment or in transit or what have you. Here, I don't know what the theory is. Mm. It just sounds um, kind of like a, a parlor game <laughs> or like, you know, some, some kind of uh, personality kind of quiz type of entertainment. Um, but you seem to think that it has some explanatory or predictive power uh, and you've uh, tried this out with the celebrities you know and love, and um, it seems to work uh, for you. Uh, so you wanted to see if it would work for us. And since we don't have a topic, and like nature abhor abhors a vacuum, uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> That's this where particular I go, yeah. topic has rushed in uh, to mm. occupy our mental space and time. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes right. to all of that and 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 that was a uh, incredible summary thank you which is why you and I, I he also he has several books i mean this is amazing mm. okay this book is you know a eight by eleven you know those mm. huge no. coffee table I, 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 just, I just googled it mark I, I just looked i saw the cover my daughter has the book I wasn't impressed. <laughs> so, <laughs> I went, I'm going, okay, and? <laughs> March 11th, 1975. Did you? Did and you, after you're done with that one, December 18. <laughs> is that your birthday? Mine's December 18. Put your December money where your mouth is, Mark. March yeah, 11th. Me. Let's see. Oh, we got a March 11th and a December 18th, okay? No, wait, wait. Which is which? I'm March well, 11th. Goes March 11th. Marco's uh, like the rest of the like like the rest of the mammalian population. He's coming uh, up for spring <laughs> time. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, Ed, how did you know your daughter had the book? Um, well, I know my daughter, and she used to live with us until a couple of years ago, and so <laughs> I had access to her library, like she has access to mine. So we all kind of know what kind of books we have. And we, we talk about um, around our dinner table, we don't talk about what happened in the news most of the time. If, if something newsworthy is mentioned, the, the discussions go in much different directions. My, my whole family history is not, is not normal in that. Not my own personal family. No, I daughter. think that's normal. No. <laughs> I but, think that's uh, normal. No, when I was, well, when I was growing up, we didn't talk about things like this around our dinner table. I can assure you, you know, my Ooh, my God. dad, my dad and my mother didn't. But but we've had um, my children grew up in California. They were born here in Germany, but they grew up in California. And I was uh, um, my California years were involved in uh, high tech because I worked. We lived and worked in Silicon Valley. I did. And my, my children came of age, so to speak, then. So they went through their school years and formative years. They're formative them. years. Yeah, we, that's, that's formative good, years. That's Zero good. to 22. Um, it was actually uh, six to 22 and four to 18, 20 kind of thing. It was in, it was in that range. Um, my, my oldest daughter, we moved to the States in, um, in August, and 30 days later was her very first day of school ever. She spoke no English at all, zero. She only spoke German, and off is, she went to school. Is your wife German? My wife's German, yeah. I met, I met her when I was stationed here, and I stayed. 
I took a European out. I never, I didn't go back to the States after my tour of duty. And I, I taught at the uh, education center, the American facilities here for a while until I got a job at a private boarding school in, um, in, a, in a nearby village. It was in a castle up on a hill. That's why I, I saw it as being very Mr. Chippish in that, in that yes. regard. Uh, uh, yes, so, you, you've talked about that. Yes, and I'm, right. go, I'm going to ask you, hmm? are you uncomfortable with, uh, or is it okay if we explore your relationship with your daughter, children, through no. the the theory of this book? No, I, I have no problem with it whatsoever. And what about her? No, she has no, no she, she likes to say, I know how weird you are, Dad. It doesn't matter. <laughs> my, my children were raised very openly. And, um, so uh, never, did, you, did you look at the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, she book. brought the book. She had it there. She said, this is kind of neat. And I said, okay, let me look. And so I looked up all the, all the people in our family. You know. So you're March 11th? No, I'm December 18th. December 18th. Yeah. My first, my first mature girlfriend was December sixteenth. Yeah, but that see. doesn't ma- that doesn't matter. No, no. The, the, the because the anyway. So you're December eighteen. Eighteen. Do you 18th. mind if I if I no, look? Go right at, ahead. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, and you tell me if it's you know where it's at. Okay. December 18th. Oh my God. I already go like this. <laughs> Is that when Hitler was born? Hitler the we, day we, have an impartial, we, have, we have two biased observers and an impartial one here. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a objective. Oh, really? The day, <laughs> yes. Since when is the, enthusiasm objective? <laughs> evidence? No, I, well, I think I think it's good that you are enthused. I, I'm I I think this is you know it's I find it a very positive sign that that you respond so so well or resonate so well. I know you hate that word, but I'm going to use it. That you resonate so well with what this guy's doing. And I'm, okay. okay. Let me let me December eighteenth. December eighteenth. The day of mammoth projects. Mm-hmm. Okay. Strengths. Capable. Expansive. Persistent. Yeah. Weaknesses. Preoccupied. Frustrated. Stubborn. Okay. As far as keywords are concerned, I would agree, but I have to say this. If you look at any good astrological um, interpretation of Sagittarius, all of those words will appear. They're, they're Sagittarian in that regard. But that's, yeah, but, but given the Zodiac, there's only 12 personalities. Given, uh, yeah, but given, given astrology, wait a second, wait a second, given astrology, there is an infinite number of possibilities. That's and, that's the key to astrology. And and I I my personal position is yes, mm-hmm. there are an infinite number of personalities. Right. right. But if we look at Young, okay, Carl mm-hmm. Young, and he tried to to categorize personality right. with his with his. Uh, you know, and it's uh, the uh, whatever it is that test. And his, yeah, he had his. Well, he had his. Um, and they do you know, like the INTJ type, or the type, yeah, right. Yeah, the Myers Briggs uh, thing. Myers right. Briggs. There you go. Right. And that's like sixteen. Mm-hmm. Sixteen. So if you go to this with a daily, you get three hundred and sixty-five. But there's multiple overlap, granted. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, but you're, nar- you're getting a better picture than you would 
with someone like Carl Jung, who people just swoon. hold on a second. Hold on a second. Yeah. You said six words. I forgot what hmm? you said. You said three positive, three strengths, and then three weaknesses. Right. That is hardly a rich description of a personality. No, uh, no, but they, 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 they that was that detail. No, he gives we a, get into detail later. That's that's first the overview. Okay. Right? Okay. That, that's yeah. the overview. That's the overview, and then, okay, and so that's why I things. said at that point we're still. If I were to compare this to, let's say, everyday astrology, newspaper astrology, well, we have those general categories that are Sagittarian sure. as opposed to Aquarian or whatever. Fine. And you know, so you know what, that. you know what, Ed. Apparently, mm-hmm. you and I are both uh, Sagittarians. Oh, really? I'm on the cusp. I'm on the cusp. What, what, what's your birthday? November 24th. Oh, okay. Well, I knew you were older than I was. <laughs> I will re- I, I will re- I will ex- uh, I will expose mine, which is yeah. dead on dead on. I will do Trump. I will do Bourdain. I will do who was it? R and I see. Okay, the, well, let's, let's, continue with, let's continue with me. I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> That's good. Uh, the meditation, you'll like this, Marco. The meditation for Ed is being rather than acting can also be challenging. I, I find that general enough to address me. I'm, 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 I'm waiting for the <laughs> Spe- specific. Well, um, I, I, again, you have you have to generalize. I mean, both of us seem to acknowledge that personality is almost infinite. In other words, personality means personal reality. Mm-hmm. But all the all, all these I don't know typologies. You start very general and mm-hmm. narrow and narrow and yeah. narrow and narrow until you get down to an individual. And that's almost impossible to categorize, right? That's why we do psychotherapy. It's like who are you? Or, or, or good astrology, just as a counterpoint to that. You know, you'd mentioned Myers-Briggs, there's 16 topologies, but INTJs, for example, only make up 3% of the population. Even though it's one of 16, there's not an even distribution across them. Exactly. Have you ever done a Myers-Briggs? Yes. And what are you? I'm, uh, this will come as no surprise. <laughs> well, none of this will ever comes as a surprise. That's a nice part about it. But... <laughs> My my dominant characteristics are executive and observant. Mm-hmm. In other words, I'm a CEO without a company. Okay. <laughs> okay. So in Myers-Briggs terms, what's your four-letter designation? Well, but those are, that's almost ridiculous in that, I'm slightly more extroverted mm-hmm. than introverted. Okay. But so I'm not extremely extroverted. I understand. And so you're E, E what? Uh, so I'm an INTJ. I, I, well, I, I can't run that. I can't run that off. Okay. But, and but and I the reason I mention that is because those are the ones that only make up 3% of the population. But See, I'm, I'm not normal in that regard. I'm not, I, no, I'm not normal I, either. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that Which you aren't. Which is why here's, you and I get along. I know. But here's part of my point. That, that INTJ is not what most people would ever expect from a Sagittarian. You see? Because there is that expansive. There's all that kind of stuff. But not on their terms. We get to the stubborn part. It's always on my terms. 
<laughs> it's on my terms. That's why I don't disagree with the stubborn, but I bet stubborn shows up a lot across your 365. But. Well, I think it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to uh, look at this guy's research. Yeah, yeah I and, think it would be. I, you know. And, and the, and uh, the strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. He lists three for each day of the year yeah. you were born on. Right. But they're not all different. There's some of them are the same. Mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. which ones occur, occur more, you know, let's do a bell curve or a distribution Mm -hmm. on which ones occur more than other ones. And then we'll start to get a bell curve of the general population. But what would be the value? Where I'm going? What, is the va no, where I'm what is the value of the information? What would, what would you do with that? And what does that allow you to do? Are you that, that's because I'm a fucking cu curious person. <laughs> yeah. Aren't we, aren't, aren't we all here? <laughs> when, Yes, when you meet when you meet someone, who are you meeting? Who are you inter? Are they basically? We've, we've already they, said that there are in, if there are infinite personality types, then you're never meeting the same person. Exactly, but there are degrees, mm -hmm. and when you you hook up, mm -hmm. you know. Marco, uh, Doug, Ed, you all have children. Mm -hmm. You all married and have children. And, and, and so there was attraction. Mm -hmm. You know, was it a good decision, a bad decision? Your children, of course, uh, most, uh, I'm going to say, most people will go to extremes to protect their children. Mm -hmm. That's a big, huge generalization. Mm -hmm. Some people don't. Some no. people discard them. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what accounts for that? Mm -hmm. that's, why, that's why it's interesting. It's like psychology, sociology, anthropology, which are all my major fields of study, you know? Why do we do what we do? And, and, and you know, what weight, okay, what weight does personality, and in this instant, the day you were born, what weight does that influence why you do what you do? I don't think I care. What? <laughs> I don't care. I really, I really don't care. Uh, the fact that it was March 11th, it, it could have been, you know, September uh, 15th. It could have been any any date. That particular uh, unit of language, that uh, signifier, that kind of fixing of a date upon my being. Um, it seems completely subordinate uh, to my individuality uh, and to the infinity of of who I am. Well, uh, I say so, it's that. And I would. I. I. I know. And but that one little perspective. That one little. Um, uh, let's say. Percentage factor or factor. Uh, framework uh, for interpreting my personality is just one of an infinitude of such frameworks. Uh, and it's a, seems like a relatively thin one uh, at that, insofar as all it seems to be based on is some kind of statistical correlation between um, somewhat That's pretty, pretty unscientifically studied uh, no. subjects. Sure. I mean, studying celebrities, what bearing does a celebrity's public, uh, publicly expressed identity have to have on the mass majority of, of human beings who do not participate in that kind of a reality? First of all, it's already a completely convoluted reality because it's a media amplified, a media transmogrified image of who and what these human beings are. 
Uh, but second of all, the sample is so skewed that it, it's a wow. real stretch, I think, wow. to make the argument that that kind of data set can be predictive of the actual data of a human being like myself or like any of us who live in a, um, well, I guess a, just in, in well, a different can reality. We, can we, can we, can you give me your birth date and I'll read you the thing and you tell me if it fits or not. Go for and, it. And this is, again, this is generalized. It mm-hmm. says you're one of 365 people, but of that, you're similar mm-hmm. to these other people born on the same day as you. All right. Cross culturally, whatever. Go for it. What's your day? Ber- March 11. 11. <laughs> oh my God. It says. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, March. I March eleventh. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! the The day of progressive intuition. Okay. Yeah. Strengths: shrewd, tasteful. Charming. All right. <laughs> Sounds good so far. Weaknesses. And maybe we'll have to talk to Kayla about this. Possessive. Claiming. Domineering. <laughs> okay. Meditation. And I, I'm not sure what meditation means. I'd have to go back to the, you know, the introduction, to see what all these things mean. Meditation. Imagine having to carry everything you own. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Nailed you, didn't it? Well. Now I can... But- uh, it has numbers and planets. Yeah, but it's, it's actually a run from I'm, I'm just advice. looking at my book collection. I had to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have any more room for books. This is the. This you is. Too, a, huh? I'm having to give them away. But let me. Let me. No, let no, me no, 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 no. Hold on. Hold okay. on a second. Hold okay. on a second. Okay. This is so inane. It really <laughs> is inane. <laughs> <laughs> It, that's not, but that's not going super, anywhere. It's not doing the, anything. But the super mind is real. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'd say unequivocally, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have zero problem with the super mind being real, and I have zero problem with the fact that these keywords do address things that are applicable. I, I don't have a problem with that either. It's, right. it's the level of specificity that is implied in this that and here's why i would would, uh, link up with marco what does it really do how does it really help us in our in our day-to-day life moving forward so to speak and see i think it's very helpful i think it's very helpful to have a general idea of how people might react to things but surprisingly enough you don't have to be together with somebody very long even virtually like we are that I would have an idea how you would react with th- something I might say. And I don't know what your birthday is, and I don't know where you come from, and I don't, I knew that we're, you know, about the same age, kind of those kind of things. But in the interaction with one another, you start picking up on those things. And, and I'm not the kind of person who thinks that, that, you know, science loves to, to, to bring in the, the predictive quality. And I think as far as that's human being, all it does. Well, that's and that's why it. that's why there is no science of human beings. Because you can't predict what human beings will do. You can have a general idea that they might, but you cannot predict what they do. And and that's that's where it breaks down for me. Because we can in the end act differently than any of these things. Even even if I 
if I'm I even if I'm a firm believer in astrological whatever it is, the first thing that you learn when you when you pick up an astrology book is that the astra inclinent sed non obligant, which yeah yeah that's what they that's how it was originally written. But the stars incline, but they don't determine. They can only tell you the probability is high that, but don't be, and is is. The follow-on is, but don't be surprised if they don't. Well, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't disagree with that. Okay, and, well, I'm sure you would. And and if we go back to uh, the physicist, and 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 you know, we had the cafe on that. Yeah, Carlo, whoever Rivelli. he was, mm -hmm. Carlo Rovelli. There you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. In the Q&A, after his lecture, a person stood up and asked him about the uh, time Wallace's question in, in his essay about time, language, and whatever it was, I forget. But he asked almost the exact question. And what's his name? Cavelli mm -hmm. said, I do not, uh, I do not adhere to the, the belief that, that, uh, and I said this earlier, human beings are, are, I don't know, irrational, what, what did I say? What did he, irrational, uh, uh, something, free will, free will is, is an illusion. He said, the physicist, the famous one, said, I don't believe that. I don't believe uh, free will is an illusion. And the reason he gave, Ed, Marco, is that it's unpredictable. Mm -hmm. You can't predict what a human being will do. So That's he said, right. therefore, therefore, it is not an illusion, free will. Mm -hmm. And the point I made, I don't know, weeks and weeks ago was the reason you can't predict is because you don't know all the variables and factors. Right. If you if you had them all, you could predict. Right, but I don't think the I don't think there's an all to be have. That that's that is the fundamental issue. There is no finite sum of factors in any human situation. It is always an infinite number of factors. Therefore, you cannot ever get them all. It, I, I understand. I understand why you're shaking your head, and that's and it's perfectly okay to do so. But you believe that there is a finite set of factors in any situation. And I believe that when, I actually believe this doesn't apply just to humans, but humans are an excellent example of this. That when it comes to humans, there are not a finite number of factors. There's all, and that's, and that's the thing, that's the thing that gets me. And this, is, this, is, this has come up in the uh, divine life, kind of like as an, an underlying sub- text that goes through there it's it's the matter of it's the difference between fin, uh, finite and infinity and and how humans are always dancing along that borderline and sometimes we're on one side of it and sometimes we're on the other and so we can't we can't know that we have them all we have when you when it comes to creativity or imagination for example there there's nothing that you can't not think about. You could think about absolutely anything. No, you can't. No, no, that's that's an that's a a abstract. And I don't know the words because I wasn't a philosophy major. But that's a that's a proposition that is a generalization. But I'm saying a specific individual has a finite. Why? Where would why, you, why does he where have would you bound the data set for that? Here's another. Here, there's also the mathematical proof. 
between the numbers one and two and one and three, say you have from one to two or zero to one. Are you zero to two. Are, are you doing Zeno zero? Uh -uh. Similar. Uh -uh. No, he's doing another one. Let us go and go ahead, Marco. There's, there's, there are infinite numbers between zero and one. And there are infinite numbers between zero and two. Are there more numbers between zero and two than there are between zero and one? And the answer is no. Are there more numbers between zero and two? That's right. <laughs> no. No, no, there no, aren't. no, no. Because, the quest, because, the question because there is not a bigger is. infinity than a lesser. There's not a bigger infinity. There is only infinity. So if mm. you have an individual, but the individual is connected to, is embedded in, is related to, can only be found in the midst of an infinite number of other conditions, there's no place to set a boundary. And wherever you set the boundary, whether it's uh, from the particular disciplines you mentioned, sociology, psychology, economics, neurobiology, wherever you set the boundary, there are always going to be infinite more boundaries beyond that's that. Zeno, more, yeah. That's Zeno's arrow, is it not? Mm. It's, it's, it's that not exactly Zeno's arrow. That, no. that you can always divide the space between... That's correct. It... it you can yes. always divide it. it. It's related to that. But it is related what it really is about is that infinity can't be reduced to any finite set. Right. And so there, if, if you... you <laughs> this gets down to progressive Marco? intuition. This gets down to progressive intuition. Because... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can't use those because, words. Uh, yeah, he can. Yeah, he, he's being, he's being, he he's being clever. That was also. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I, I don't think that you can demonstrate to me. I can. A, 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 a complete set. And I think that I could very clearly intuit an infinite, an infinitude. But if beyond I could, set. but if I could. It's not. No, I'm asking you to produce it. Produce it right now. Show me where the inf show me where the finite set would be that could explain, predict. I can't uh, do it. I can't do it mathematically. Mm -hmm. well, Can you do it I, empirically? I, a, I, I yes. I'm a pragmatist. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, going and I know you looked at it, Marco. The the link I did about the guy lost in the Amazon, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, what determined his behavior? I've been lost in the wilderness. I don't know. I would imagine none of you have, but I have. And you, and you have to make decisions based upon what mathematical formulas this that or the other thing no you make a decision based upon what you know and who you think you are and what you can do and in his particular case and you asked this he was starving Mm -hmm. And he was uh, exhausted. In those particular situations, your mind goes to that, I don't, you want to call it super, whatever. It, it starts to hallucinate. Okay. I've been there. I've been there on... Uh, pharmaceutically induced mm -hmm. and I've been there in the wilderness but I take exception with the description that's a hallucination uh, that's not mm -hmm. the way that this fellow described what he saw uh, and I'm not saying that it wasn't a hallucination but it, you seem to want to say that you know, the vision that he saw it was of, of a girl who mm -hmm. he saved and at, the, at his point breaking point where he was considering taking his life uh, because no he... not taking his life giving up surrender mm -hmm. all right whatever right okay. um you're right uh 
he's he he saw this girl and she inspired him to to fight on to you know to find uh you know to find other people that could help him you're calling that a hallucination i'm saying he did. that that's he did. okay well he 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 didn't Doesn't actually, mean he's not, right. not in that video he maybe in the book he did i didn't see that but um he left it it seemed to me that he left it open uh who she was where she came from what her me I mean, what it meant to, clearly to him was something to live for, uh, and it became part of a, uh, you know, um, a story, a, a, a lifelong mission, a quest. Right? He goes back to that to that forest, and he helps the indigenous people there to establish a um, a tourist spot, uh, a kind of an eco resort. So, and that's that's part of their vision for how they could save their homeland because it's under threat from you know, oil exploration or whatever other, you know, industrial, uh, modern concerns. So he has a vision of a, of a girl. And, you know, I think what you're trying to say, or what I hear you saying, is that his brain produces a hallucination that is an expression of this drive that's within him, this psychological drive, this life drive to survive. That drive uh, induces this you know, kind of sets, creates a dream, if, if you will, to induce him, to trick him uh, into living. And I think that I mean, there's a, uh, there's like a fundamental um, difference of perspective. So uh, you, me, he? Yes, what? definitely. Um, and <laughs> I, I think that it comes up in Aurobindo as well. And, and I think it's part of the something that Don Salmon on the forums has been uh, trying to point to. It's something I'm just getting kind of into, like getting a perspective on myself. Because the question is, what is ultimately real? And the, the, the presupposition that Aurobindo makes, the presupposition of the idea of the supermind, is that the individual ego, the individual brain, the individual body is not what's ultimately real. Or rather, it's ultimately real as an expression of an ultimate reality that is prior to and exceeds it in every way possible. And this Aurobindo has multiple names for. He has a, a whole cartography for. Mm. But it, it is, he describes it in terms of the supermind. He has various Vedic terms for it, like the Brahman. Uh, and then he has ways of describing different aspects of the Brahman, the passive Brahman, which is kind of like a nothingness, and then the active Brahman, which is a, an activity in the world. He also calls it the supermind, but at the core of the supermind is what he calls Satchidananda, being consciousness bliss. And that reality, the intuition of that reality and the expression of that reality, this is my understanding of Aurobindo and what I kind of am relating to so far, is what is fundamentally real and of the essence and of import. And everything else is an expression of it and is true and real, but cannot be explained in terms lesser than it ultimately, because they are each a concretization or, an, or a manifestation of that ultimate. Now, the argument, the revolutionary aspect of Aurobindo's thought is to, um, to, I would say, destroy the sense that the concretion, that the kind of local node is the ultimate in the sense of containing everything or ex able to explain everything. So I think if you go to the brain or you say it's the personality or you say it's this set of drives or you say that it's um, you know, what could be explained by, by science in mental and rational terms, I think that there's just a fundamental difference of perspective there. And what Aurobindo is saying, as I understand it, is that there's a reality that is infinitely deeper than that, infinitely deeper, infinitely more real. And then he has all these ways of describing it. I'm not saying I agree with him philosophically. I'm saying that that there is yeah. a um, yeah. there's a there's there's 
there's there's no there, there's a <laughs> this is what down salmon is kind of talking about too like the um there's a fundamental difference i think in perspective and uh that's a I, I don't know how how else to communicate it i'm working on how to communicate what that is or even just how to understand what that is but i don't hear it like i don't think it's really i don't think that the the point of view that that reality comes from your individual self is correct. I think that's an error. I think it's just, an, I think that's an illusion. No, I'd agree. I would agree with that. What I'm saying or what I'm, you know, we've got there. It's sort of a circuitous route is that if you are alone in the wilderness, the jungle, it's you and all these things you're talking about. And what, uh, what determines what you do next? What determines that? And I've been there. I've been there. This, this guy, Yosef, uh, that's an amazing story. I recommend the movie. I haven't read the book. I watched the movie. And, and to, uh, when push comes to shove, what do you do? And why? Is push coming to shove? Push, you, live or die. Is that, Is that the question okay, right that's now? Push, that, that, that's push come, that's push shove, right? I know, but I'm asking: Is that what's is that the question right, right now, or is push coming to shove? Like, are we in a life and death situation right now? Do we need to to know? Because how would we know unless we were in that situation? How would I know what to do next unless I was there? Like, how do I know what to do next right now? Right. What determines what, it? Right. Exactly. What deter determine is the word, and. I'm saying that part of the determination is when you, or this book, okay? Part of that determination, I don't know how much, is the day in which you were born. If this doesn't help. Marco, I, think I you're, you're Yeah, hi, Doug. <laughs> You got a like you got a thing in front. All right, here let me let me just say one thing, Doug. Yeah. I'm trying to write a poem. I need to find the right word. What determines that word? Good question. Yes. Very good. Okay, that's all I have to and say. I, and I would say why why even bother writing? <laughs> but I've said that before, but uh if you can get your volume up a bit. And I got a thing across your face, Doug, that says chat, hide non-video participants. Can I, how do I get, get rid of that? Does this work better? There, did it. I'm a genius. Can you hear me better now? Not that much, but... But go ahead. I, we'll, I think we'll, my uh, my phone has been oh, waterlogged. That's, really that's oh, great. Okay, that's better. I I was uh, waterlogged. I was out in a major thunderstorm that came through here. Oh. Um. So I didn't see the significance of the conversation at the time. I <laughs> chose a horrible Wi-Fi spot. Um, anyways, we. What was I going to say about, I guess, in that moment, what you're talking about, Mark, there's, there's the thought. And if I'm hearing all of this correctly, like what determines the thought, there's something behind the thought. Um, I don't know what I wanted to say, to be honest. But. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's, it's, it's so you basic. Talk, I, maybe, and I'll, I'll pick up. I, I, I want to say that I want to say this. What does it? I want to say echo Ed's thought. What does it matter if if it's life and death? If you are in that moment of having to decide what to do next, um, a personality theory, a philosophy, an ideology uh, is not going to help. Uh, but. That doesn't make sense. Hold on one second. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, Hi Jeffrey. Welcome. Not sure what about the, to- not sure about the topic, but I'm willing to to, to wing it. <laughs> All right, we're kind of in the middle of a sort of, I'd say, a kind of messy conversation. Uh, I think we're trying to get at something, or Mark is trying to get at something. Uh, and, uh, it, it began with this kind of personality typology around one's birthday and the book, uh, the secret language of birthdays that, that, that Mark brought up, uh, I'm having some, uh, opposition to it. Uh, I'm raising objections to, uh, the, um, not only the content I'd say of the book or the argument of it, but the premise of it, uh, as, as well as it's utility, uh, value and, um, meaning, um, to anything. (laughs) And so, um, so, but, but somehow we've gotten back to the question of free will. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, uh, physicist Carlo Rovelli and, uh, a comment that he made in response to a question where he said that he, uh, wouldn't question, uh, free will, uh, because, you know, humans, in his view, are unpredictable. And then Mark uh, gave the example of, of uh, a fellow, and he says himself, who has been lost in the wilderness and um, you know, at the edge of their ability to survive, their will to, 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 to keep going. Uh, and what determines what they do in that situation? Uh, and I was saying, well, that's kind of a hypothetical um, because unless we're in that situation, it'd be very hard to predict what that is. Uh, and then I made the, was in the middle of making the point that a psychology of philosophy, et cetera, doesn't help. I didn't mean that it wouldn't be helpful to be able to refer to a set of values or to an idea about the world if you're in a situation like that. But with respect to that core will, that core will to live, that will to keep going, to not surrender, to not give in, to not lay over and die. Uh, another story that from that I love, I've never, well, uh, a story that I love is um, uh, not the call of the wild, also by Jack London, to build a fire, I think it was called. And it's about a man who finds himself in a, a tundra in an Arctic wilderness uh, and is freezing to death. It's the story of this man freezing to death. And there is a moment when one is when one is becoming more and more um, what's the word? Kind of like t- tempted to let go, tempted to uh, to give in to that kind of oceanic feeling that starts to arise in that extreme state, where you could sort of let go and die or you could somehow kindle the will to live and and so that's the metaphor of building a fire or for this man in the amazonian jungle it was the vision of the girl who inspires him to keep going for her sake and perhaps that it was something with you mark when you were lost in the wilderness that kept you going um i mean i think that that's a profound question I, i find that the kind of personality type thing the what's your birthday doesn't even begin to get at the profundity of that question. Why I love you, Marco. <laughs> and, I, and this guy, the the guy who wrote the book, Gold Gold. Gold 
Schneider. He's also done other books about uh, relationships. But within this book, or maybe it's a relationship, he, he categorizes them. This is all based on just a sample of the population, okay? Which he has access to, which are uh, famous people, who, uh, biographies and whatnot. Uh, he, the book about relationships says, you know, what, what are you best, what do you best match up with? Is it love, friendship, parenting, or siblings? It's fascinating stuff, and it's pretty, I'm saying, it's pretty damn accurate. And so far, nobody has come up with anything that it isn't. It's, it's way more specific than young than anyone. It doesn't take into account everything, which is impossible. But it's way more specific than the Myers-Briggs or things like that. What do you say, Jeffrey? Well, I like the Myers Briggs, but <laughs> um, I, I I don't know. I need to listen a bit more. Have you guys been talking for a while? Because I had it marked down at one. Yes, we shifted the time to noon Mountain okay. Time. Okay, a few a few weeks ago, it was okay. communicated imperfectly. It's still shown as one on the site, so. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> let me let <laughs> me check. Ma- let me check March eleventh on that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That bitch. Just fucking with you, Marco. Never mind. So okay. Uh, secret language of birthdays. Check it out. Sounds, sounds like good, uh, and uh, no, it's a it's potentially a, helpful, interesting. I don't, I don't know, I don't know that, I don't know that any of those things are useful because what we do, we we go out into the world. And we meet, and and we there's an attraction to somebody. As far as I know, we're all we've all been married. We have children. So what drives that? Why do we pick this person, not that person? Certainly, if I went into if I walked down to the pool, and I and I've done this not too long ago, and, and there's an attraction between me and, an, and a person of the opposite sex. I'm not going to resort to a book. I'm just going to go with whatever. What the book may tell me is why I do, why I behave the way I did. But it's not going to stop me or induce me unless I'm in, you know, totally, I don't know, but that's not who I am. If you look at my birth date, I am a motherfucker. (laughs) Uh, And I will, I am adventurous, curious, all those things. Ed, I noticed you're on mute, but maybe I'll add a little bit here. Um, going back to the out in nature, stranded. Um, it, like you're saying, I'm not going to be using this personality test. I won't be worried about the Myers-Briggs when I'm worried more about starting a fire. 
but my personality in general will will have some sort of effect on that. And maybe it might be nice to know beforehand, like if I'm a depressive personality and would rather heap up in a pile rather than heap up a pile of wood to start a fire, then maybe I can go against that or something. But uh, yeah, there's I, I fall in the 10% category where I'm it doesn't apply to me. I, I did when you posted it, I checked it out and it was a complete miss. According to me, I mean, maybe I don't know myself or <laughs> something like which, that. But which are you talking to Ed or, or I'm talking me? to you mm -hmm. about your so what's your birthday? It's October 11th, 1982. But it doesn't even begin to account for me at age eight. Well, I guess it does ask for the year. So maybe if I entered in a different year, it might say whatever. But um, that's, I, I think, it's beside the I point. I think though. it fits. I think it at least fits. one part fits. But then later mm -hmm. on, it goes on to say I'm a I'm an asshole and uh, outgoing and all these other things that are typically not me. But <laughs> yeah, we've been meaning to talk to you about that, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> can I read? Can I read it, Doug? Go ahead. Okay, October 11th says the day of grace, gracious ease. I'd agree with that. And then the strength, charming, yep. Accepting, yep. Secure, oh. weaknesses, complacent, passive, uh, uh oh. So, uh, a lot of this is is you know what are what is manifesting in your life at a particular time? Are you manifesting within your positive attributes? And this goes to Jungian and we talk archetype the shadow and the uh, you know, the other thing, what is manifesting in your life at a particular time? Is it your strengths? Are you optimizing what you're really your strengths? Or are your weaknesses, a shadow, wiggling in there and dominating what you manifest? That's and I'm not making uh, the thing, this, this book doesn't judge. It just says people have positives and negatives. The, the, what's the, op the light and the shadow and, and all these factors interact. Uh, and it's up to you sort of to navigate but yeah, if I meet a woman, I don't friggin' open the book and and check it out. It's like so. so, so why is this so important then? To you, I mean, you. No, nah, it was just called a parlor game, and this conversation's been called a bunch yeah. of poppycock. It's been called amusing, but it's <laughs> you're you're even saying you're disposing of it, so. And on, on that little trait there, there's, yes, the six traits, and then it goes on, and it's everything that's not me, but it, it covers the gamut of, oh, I agree with that, and I disagree with that. But I, I think we're all saying it's kind of besides the point at this point. And I think it's interesting in that yeah. oh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a naturalist, I believe that human beings, we are part of, of nature. We are not of a super mind. We may think we are, but we're part, I mean, sort of eco-psychologist. We are part of the life on earth. And, and this sort of goes to that. 
Not that anybody can figure anything out. And it's the just, chapters we're reading with uh, Life Divine right now focus I don't, on life. I, I know you don't have to, but I'm saying I, it It kind of cycles around and it's saying yeah. we're in our perspective here. and It's good to know that we're not ever going to be the super mind. And if anybody thinks so, then they're wrong. Uh, but it, No, here's the, here's the thing. Yeah. You... You could, and I would, I would link it to this book, if you are of the nature of this, you can sit there. In other words, if we do Oral Bindo's uh, birth date, which probably you do, should we look that up, see if that fits? No, I, I think, I mean, I'd like, I think the question is, is there an ultimate reality that is in some form intelligent and that when you ask what determines, uh, that is determinative uh, of manifestation, of experience? And where do you place that ultimate reality? How do you refer to that, that reality? Uh, uh, you know, one can fall along a whole spectrum a complex spectrum of different points of view on that. I think, though, that to, to very gen, you know, to car- to um, generalize in a very stereotypical kind of way, in a very broad kind of way, uh, or there is the view. Or- there is the view that there is an intelligence. There is a something like what Aurobindo calls a, a Brahman or a supermind or a Satchidananda. There is something that is fundamentally, like at its core, in its essence, uh, intelligent, uh, aware, and he adds blissful, like that it, it has a quality to it. Of Which word? Delight. This, I'm talking about Aurobindo and his vision of his view of the supermind or the Brahman or the ultimate. I think that there are other views on that which don't, posit, view, or recognize uh, a, an ultimate reality with qualities such as intelligence, bliss, being, and so forth. In fact, I mean, th- there, you know, this is the history of, of metaphysics, um, but it also plays itself out in all kinds of things. Like if you bring a psychology test, there's a kind of metaphysical view behind that about what human beings are, which you know, you are representing. You're saying that human beings are part of nature. So what is nature? Where does nature come from? Uh, I think that part of the interesting thing about reading a philosopher like Aurobindo is that he presents a very strong, coherent, expansive, um, I would say well-articulated view of his vision of what that is. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm not saying that I believe in it. But the very fact that he is, that, that it is there to be explored and experienced, at, even as a mental construct, opens up, I think, channels of experience in real life. And I, I'm, you know, I, I do metaphysics. I do poetry and art. And so I concern myself with these kinds of ultimate questions as a matter of, as a matter of art, as a matter of my, my way of expressing myself in the world. But I don't go, you know, I don't like live my daily life as if I'm in supermind. However, if I read about supermind every day and I meditate with it, then something starts to shift in the quality of my daily life. That's, I think, what I'm experiencing. And it's, I think, a, an aspect of all of these different worldviews is that they afford or they allow for or they kind of provide the parameters for certain kinds of experiences. Uh, and that's not to say one is true or the other is false. It's just, it's just to notice what they make possible in terms of how one lives and what one's relationships are like and what one does with one's time. Uh, so, um, which I, yeah, well, okay. Well, that, just to finish my thought, I mean, that's why I think it's interesting to study a diversity of, of such views because it gives more options. 
That's all. Can I speak? Who said that? I did, Jeffrey. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I don't know where I'm at on Aurobindo yet. Um, so I'd kind of like to put that to one side. Um, but to be transparent, I, although I don't know, I haven't read the book that you're talking about. Um, as I mentioned, I like the Myers-Briggs, but I think that's more, in a way, more scientific than this kind of thing. But um, I do um, read tarot cards, and I do do numerology. And numerology is all about birth dates. So, um, you, so, I, but, so I have, I've done that, you know, I'm 62. I've done that since I was 10. So I've done it all my life, that kind of thing. Since so, you were 10? Yeah, 11, 12, learning and interested in those subjects. So I want to know about your parents. <laughs> so I've done it a long time, but what I'm saying is, and I'm also a scientist, so for many scientists, that's a very odd thing to do. And I have been challenged on it on a number of occasions. Um, but for me, I mean, I have a kind of an explanation or a, a kind of a way of thinking about it, uh, but it's maybe more to do with synchronicity kinds of arguments than it has to do with super being, super mind, that kind of thing. Although I understand the two are, have affinities, let's say, that they're, they're not entirely distinct from one from the other. Uh, but I tend to think of them as that there are patterns and resonance that repeat themselves in the universe at all scales. And that what one is doing, one is doing these things, is one is tapping into the way patterns tend to uh, repeat and resonate. And so it's a kind of a, you know, and I, I tend to think that it's, you know, I, I think I read at one point something when I was learning tarot, when I was doing tarot, um, that you have these systems for reading these patterns like tarot or numerology or, or astrology, which I, which I don't touch for reasons I don't fully understand, but uh, I'm not that interested in astrology. Um, but um, I, um, so what was I saying? Do you find some validity? You're, you're maybe making a case for the, the validity, usefulness, um, value of the, working with these kinds of systems. I think, that, just to interrupt, there's a distinction between validity and usefulness. But it I, I be, use them. It may be true, but it has no usefulness. No, I disagree. I use tarot. I, 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 I read my own tarot cards, and I use what I, what I pick up to orient and understand the current situation of my life. And uh, this is what I was going to say, is that I think that if you, if you understood the way the patterns relate to each other, you could look at the raindrops on a window and get the same information. It, it's just that we have these systems like tarot cards and numerology, but the patterns repeat themselves everywhere. And if you can read them. And so that that's you know it's an odd idea but it's the one that i've used even though it's not scientifically grounded very well but it is a way of giving a sense to and i do like the myers briggs it's a different as i say i think it has a more of a grounding uh is more credible in science areas i use it because in uh, what myers briggs is interesting is it tells you that there are people like you and there are people to, that are different from you and, I, and that you often encounter, you often surround yourselves with people who are like you. And so you think everybody is like that. But then you, you move outside your comfort zone 
like in a work environment, and all of a sudden you encounter people that don't act or don't think or don't function the same way you do at all. And the Myers-Briggs helps me understand those people and learn how to adapt my ways of relating to them that's different from what I do in my everyday environment. Now, that's the way I use the Myers-Briggs, but I use the tarot in a similar way. And I have used the numerology in similar ways as well. If it gives me something, and useful is my criteria, if it gives me something that's useful, do I really care whether it's scientifically valid or not? If it gives me something I can actually use in my life, I could care less whether it's scientifically grounded. Somebody can come along and say it's your pure imagination. Well, then so be it. My pure imagination in this context gives me something that's useful. So I don't worry too much about the causality of the thing. Well, uh, may I? Marco's, again, Marco's birthday say, says the day of progressive intuition, which I don't, that describes him. And I'd be interested, Jeffrey, because in this book, there is a tarot reading. If you would be willing to give your birth date and I would read the tarot readout for the one in 365 people, if you'd be willing to... Yeah, my birthday is the 28th of December, oh. 1956. So you're a, you're a Capricorn, but a Cusper. Cusper. Well, close. Well, it's called a Cusper, and we're, I'm a Cusper. We're really, we're really interesting people. Uh, December 28th? Yeah. The day of the St. Innocence. It, well, this says the day of simple sophistication. <laughs> oh, my God. The tarot reading on this is the first card of the major arcana is the magician who symbolizes intellect, communication, information, as well as magic. Over his head is an infinity symbol, which in some tarot decks takes the form of a hat, in others a halo. Many interpretations may be drawn, one of which is the magician recognizes the cyclical and unending nature of life and is empowered by the understanding. The positive traits suggested by the first card include <laughs> diplomatic skill and shrewdness, but negatively, lack of scruples and opportunism. So the magician is my card. Yeah. <laughs> well, Although I I'm have some others. I'm just saying. It's related to my name. My name means, uh, Jeffrey means God's messenger. So it's the person who connects the up there with the down here. And the magician, if you look at the card, one hand is raised and one hand is, is down. So it's the exact image of that. That's why the magician's card is, is the card that, uh, that... That works. That works. And, and, and this is odd because we're... This is all new, uh, this technology. May I read your strengths and weaknesses according to this... Sure. Research. Uh, December 28th, strengths, self-assured, sophisticated, dependable. 
weaknesses overconfident aloof lonely you need not comment <laughs> i don't think i'm lonely <laughs> well uh, you, the, those are weaknesses so you're operating in your your you know in your positive strength it's just fun we're just having fun this is a cafe it's funny that you said um, that you wouldn't um, approach a woman without um, by looking at the book well when i met my wife i did look up the chinese zodiac because it was one part of our conversation and she was considered highly incompatible with me uh, which we always laughed about but but it was nonetheless it formed an interesting counter note to the relationship and we were always aware of each other's you know characteristics and how they didn't always jive it was it was part of the relationship so again i i used it even though even though it said the opposite of what we did so i don't use it to decide one thing or the other but i use it as a way of informing how one operates and functions and understands the world Hear a clock tick tocking. <laughs> Not mine. Maybe it's the doomsday clock. <sighs> now uh, we're recording which means in some degree we're censored if we choose to be uh, my my son's coming in tomorrow and it's a complicated relationship which this research that this guy does predicts born on his day, born on my day, it says the worst relationship is uh, parent-child. And it, yeah, it's a struggle. But what does it say about tomorrow? <laughs> say about what? Does it have any information about what's going to happen tomorrow when you see them? No, this is research. Research looks at the past. Uh, so is this going to help you tomorrow? Or will it play a role in it? Or will it just be the book that you enjoyed for a bit and no, I'm, come what may. I'm very mindful of that uh, it's a struggle. We're not of the same mind. It's a struggle. Doesn't mean I don't I love him more than anything else in, in the world. And I, and I think if you would ask him, he'd probably say the same thing. But the interaction is still a struggle. It's not all, you know, it just doesn't mesh like one would hope it would. 
and I'm talking here, you know, those of us who think about these things, <laughs> you know, philosophers, whatever. Go ahead, Ed. One or, one of the things that um, let me butt in just for a second. Um, a lot of times, my my grandson acts in ways that my daughter and my son-in-law uh, wish would be otherwise. And one of the phrases that slips out of their mouths very often is, I don't deserve this. And I've always told them, because I firmly believe this, we never, we never get what we deserve. We only ever get what we need. There's a reason why, I'm going to say it that bluntly, not like there's some cosmic reason or somebody sitting up there working through a ledger to make sure that you come into things. But every encounter that we have with another human being is an opportunity for us to figure out who we are and who we should be. And we need, I believe, from my, where, how I see the world, we need to take advantage of those situations. And we need, we need to rise to the occasion. We, we simply have to know whatever it is that's happening right now is good for me. It's good for my, my, my being. I can become a better person because of whatever it is I'm going through, whether it's pleasurable. This is one of the things I have. I'm, I'm one of those people that, uh, for example, with the Aurobindo, that everything is ultimate delight, I think is a very deceiving way of saying things because there's too many people running around and think uh, at some day we're all going to be blissful. And I don't think that we are because I, for one, don't want to live in a world that is just bliss. I want to have adversity. I want to have some pain. I want to, to have those contrasts of feelings that remind me how alive I actually am. And without those contrasts, this goes back to our Meru discussion, the, the, you know, the ultimate, there has to be an ultimate distinction because without distinction, there's, what is it? There's nothing. So, so give me some distinction. Now, sometimes it works out very well, and sometimes it doesn't work as well. But, but these, are, these are opportunities for us to, to become whoever it is that we really are. And we don't know. And I find all of these, I'm like, you know, uh, Jeffrey, I've been playing with numerology and astrology for a long time. And, it, and, it's, and it's a lot of fun. And, and I find this a lot of fun, you know, kicking around this guy's you know, birthday book, because it's just, it's just another way of maybe looking at my reality as I currently encounter it. And so it gives me an opportunity to reflect on that and what is and what isn't. And, and a lot of times I get helpful hints and a lot of times I'm going, oh, I have no idea what that's all about. And you just throw it over your shoulder and move on. And because to me, it's about the interaction. You simply have to engage whatever it is that is there. And that's what I, I tell my children when I say, well, it's, it's what you deserve, not what you deserve. It's what you need, because at that point, you simply have to deal with what's there. And this is the thing that I really like about Aurobindo is that he tells us there's a lot more there than you think there is. So be prepared for a lot of surprises. But if you stop and reflect upon it or penetrate it or look at it, you realize there's a coherency there as well that leads us towards something other than what it is that we have right now or we're experiencing right but, now. Yeah. But, when you when you say that, does that imply that there's a super mind determining, directing? When okay, and to that I have to say yes and no. Supermind, yes. Determining, no. I have no problem with a supermind. But that supermind is not making me, determining me, telling me. I, I have every no, reign. No? no, but it's, it's giving you the information and your choosing not to accept it? No, is that it's what you're saying? It, it, is, it is simply 
presenting me with whatever with whatever I encounter. What I do with what I encounter is up to me eventually. Well, isn't what you encounter an interpretation of, of, of what you think it is? And it may be something other than what you think it is? I'm not completely sure I understand where you're going with that. So, uh, just a quick thing. I, it, my understanding of supermind is that it acts through you. It's not something that determines what you do. It's something that is in you, and you act. Fr- you know, you act from that. So, okay. yeah, my and my understanding is, it's the other way. It's something that that we act within. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I agree, but it's, but it's that and also. It's not like, there's not like a directionality of causality or anything. No. Yeah. This is there, where Orovin knows language and the modernity of it. <clears throat> Some of the concepts that he, he uses, I think, are is a little bit problematic because he does speak of supermind in terms of capital K, knowledge, capital yeah. W, will, capital B, being. Mm capital C consciousness. And I don't think it's such a problem if you're not concerned with the sort of semantics and the kind of linguistic turn in philosophy. I think if you just try to see what he's talking about, that it makes sense. Because what he might say is that the supermind determines its own indeterminacy. It determines... Yeah. Your own free will, in the sense that you're kind of like Sartre said, you're condemned to be free. <laughs> and so it's, you can't really frame it in these mechanistic terms where there's a causal relationship between A and B such that A determines B. Moreover, if you really take the idea of infinity seriously, then really kind of blows up all kinds of mental conceptions. Really, there's no mental conception that is adequate. Oh, (laughs) Marshall. Well, I mean, here's one thought I'm kind of wrestling with a bit. If humanity is on this evolutionary arc from inconscient matter through life and mind to supermind, but that's taking place within supermind in infinite uh, be, infinite being, then why hasn't it happened already? Exactly. <laughs> or rather, pr- what if it has already happened? Uh, and then if that's the case, I think we could read Aurobindo in a very different way. Uh, but and is it, time coming to it? I think Aurobindo, I mean, this whole evolution idea is that Things need to happen, need to transition or to move through different states. Maybe I'm not getting it right, but... I I think that's right. Hmm? I I would agree with that. The reason why it hasn't happened is because we haven't gone through all the states that we have to go in order to get there. Who's we? Who's we? Well, for now, it's the five of us. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> we're a, we're it's a still a we and I. <laughs> but I think Aurobindo is also talking about you know humanity as a species and mm. the um, emergence of mental being in humanity, and, uh, perhaps and the possibility for a post-humanity that partakes of or let's say, operates out of a supramental being or supramental uh, understanding. I mean, that, that's, that seems to be his visionary proposition, that, there's some, that humanity is a transitional uh, species. And to, I, although he may what? not be really making that to from what? the Darwinian... To what? The supermind? Not exactly. I mean, I, I don't know his, his whole thought, you know, well enough, but... I, I, 
he is positing in these chapters that we're reading now that there are um, other orders, kinds, like of being. So matter is one kind of being. Life is another kind of being and covers a whole range of beings from microorganisms to plants to animals. Animal consciousness brings another kind of order of being that you don't find in matter. And humans bring another. So there are these discrete stages in the grand evolutionary arc. And what he is, I think, saying based on progressive intuition is, or maybe what I'm saying, um, but is that there are other orders of being. There's another order of being that he calls supramental that can be kind of mediated through the mind, through a conceptual schema, and that's what this philosophy is about, but fundamentally is not reducible to that. You have to relate to it or you have to embody it or express it on its own terms. And those terms are, well, I mean, that, that's, the, that's what I think is at the, the core of the book, and that's what the book is about. Um, and that's what I was talking about earlier with this um, notion of that, that what your, what your understanding of ultimate reality is, 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 is what's I think operative because his, well, let me just finish this point. His ultimate reality, what's the kind of core inside behind the, you know, every single veil is what he calls Satchitananda. That's being consciousness bliss. And that, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think we, um, are really, um, like when I glimpse that or when it, what to the degree that I sense that or to the degree that I've had experiences, like discrete experiences in time, I'm not talking about like permanent realizations, but experiences of that, it really just turns everything upside down. It, it, it really turns around really what you understand your life to be about and everything to be about. And so um, I, I think that that's, part of what is interesting about reading Aurobindo for me now is that it's, it's quite a challenge to my default mode of being. And I think it's a, a challenge to humanity's default mode of being. And it's, it's saying there is another possible way to be that doesn't presuppose the separation of self from self or self from world, but rather has at its core the felt experience sense of unity that's that's where i think he's coming from and that's radical i think it's profoundly radical with respect to the way the status quo and the way that the world is currently constructed and represented i object and the obje uh, objection is <laughs> well in 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 so many levels it, the, if I were allowed to interrupt, I could object at each each point. But we we go back to, and it's absolutely beautiful, Marco's whatever it was, but he didn't put pictures with it. The loneliest road. And that speaks to all of this. Aurobindo, the guy was locked up. So what the hell did he have other than his mind to construe some meaning about what does it mean? And if you go on the loneliest road, which Margo and I have both done, it's, a, it's an actual road out here in the west of the United States. And, and he, he made this beautiful audio. What do you call it, Marco? What is that? I called it a meditation, but it was kind of a sound collage. Yeah, yeah it was crazy. I'm in it with, with Marco and I talking about after debate number one. It, it's crazy, but it's, it's also very beautiful. He blends music. He blends all this stuff. And it goes to the point of what I'm saying. 
if you're alone in the wilderness, you are faced with decisions, which if you're locked in a cell, you have no decisions. You have no freedom, which is, I think, where Arl Bindo started. His, or you know, he was a he he was against all. You know, God bless him. Uh, but when you are in isolation, you your mind goes to all sorts of different places, and. I think I think Marco's audio. What do you call it again? What is it? It's called the meditation. Lotus. Yeah, yeah. And then and then in the book I'm writing, and it's 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 damn near ready. Your prelude to thoughts on the election is fabulous. It's beautiful. Uh, is it your book? This is. What? You put it in the book? Yes. I asked your permission. Okay. You said yes. Yes, I did. It's it's beautiful. It's like this is what I want to hear from people. And we're so far now away from that. It's crazy. It's crazy. So where does all this come from? Where does all this come from? It, that's, that's part of my nature, and it's here in the book. That's, that's who I am. And, and so here we are, the three, four, five of us, trying to figure this stuff out. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's great. It's not like we were in a cafe, really. We could order another round. And you said something, Marco, in in your that meditation, said they have a room for you. And I'm gonna loop this back to mother in that movie. When they come in, somebody they say we have a room for you. It's so friggin' eerie. It's incredible. I'm going to stop there. Unless you, all of you have nothing to say, and I'll continue. <laughs> well, I'm, I've been, Aurobindo, um, I'm wondering the answer to this question of what moves you? What moves one? Why do anything? Like why continue, right? He has an answer for that, actually. I don't know if I buy the answer. But he says that this is the play of the divine. And the divine hurls itself into into separation in order to create longing and aspiration for reunion. I don't know if I, you know, if I um, can really believe in that starting point because it presumes some a starting point. There's the divine being who acts in some way. Like, so there's an origin, this ca- first cause. I think that's a kind of myth. But I think there's something to the idea that we separate ourselves, we kind of refine ourselves, we individualize ourselves, would be maybe the, the Jungian or the psycho, psychological way of looking at it. And, that cre- and, and, and we're, we're called to do, we're moved to do that we're impelled to do that and, 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 and then it circles back around because the individuation comes to a point where it wants to, to reunite with its source. And I, I think that, that that movement of return, that movement of reunion, um, 
not prior to, but through the individuation, through the radicalization of that individualization, in fact. I think that that's part of what Aurobindo is talking about. But I don't think you can get there without going through the, the individuation and the separation, without going down the loneliest road. <laughs> well, back to a, yeah, back to a point I made a long time ago, uh, you know, get your, but it isn't for everybody. Get yourself into the wilderness. Find out who you are. And I don't think you have to go to the wilderness to do that, Mark. I think, I think that's what happens to us every single day of our lives. We're always confronted with that question. One of the things that fascinated me about Keepser was when you look at his structure, Keepser, John Keepser. He's oh, another, yes. another person we Keepser. read. Yeah. One of the things that fascinates me about his structures of consciousness is that the magical is egoless. And there's, rem there's kind of like a hinting of ego in the mythical, and it's only in the mental that an ego comes about. And when he talks about integral consciousness, it's a supersession of the ego itself. Well, that's kind of, that kind of makes sense, because if you don't have an ego, how could you supersede it? You kind of have to build that up in order to get over it. And that's how I see how a lot of things in our lives go. We're constantly confronted with experiences that we have to come to terms with. And we have to figure out a way to do that. And, and you know, from where I come from, Aurobindo is, is expressing this one way. But I see Hermeticists saying the same thing. I see the Kabbalists saying the same thing. Everybody, everybody's basically saying the same thing that... You have to you you have to come to terms with what is, but first you have to figure out what's there, and in order to do that, you have to stop and not just think about it. You have to feel about it. You actually, you know, my way. I I think you have to start. I'll back up. There's an old Kabbalistic saying that says our feelings tell us what to think. And what we do for the most part, and this happens a lot in our cafes, and a lot of this is here tonight, we think first and feel later. And I, I, don't, I think that's the wrong way around. We have to feel first and think later. We have to actually get in touch with our feelings and what are, what are, we, resonant, what are we in tune with? What, are we, what do we feel good about and, and what do we avert for whatever reasons? Do and in doing that, huh? I do you really think that's true? Don't we feel first and then build a story to justify what we no, feel? No, we build a story. No, I, yes, but we build a story to explain, not to justify. There's a difference. There, there's a huge difference. And I think we build stories to explain, and then we tell each other our stories. And we recognize in the stories that we're told and that we tell others where the overlaps are, where the disconnects are. And in the process of trying to, to harmonize those with one another, that we come to understand what it is that we're doing and where we may be going or what, what all of this is actually about. And, it's, and it's, 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 it's in that process of doing that that we gain a little more clarity about who we are and where we may be going and why we're here and all of those kinds of things. But, but they're all based on a certain amount of assumptions. And I, I'm one of those people that believes you have to dig down deep and find out what are you assuming and then figure out why do I assume that as opposed to something else. And that part we tend to ignore because it's, I think that's the hardest part of the work is getting down and find out what we assume. I do not believe, for example, and I use the word consciously believe, that stories are merely figments of our imagination. I don't believe that. I believe that they are expressions of, I'll call that, uh, the more real parts of our own nature. I believe that that 
that there are, they are attempts to put into words, because that's what we have as human beings, we have words, whatever it is that I feel in the deepest part of my being. That's what I believe stories are about. And I believe that every single story that anyone has ever told and has ever written down or that we read, that was the uh, initial motivation. Well, I can't prove that. And I don't think I need to. It's just how I operate in the world. The, but but I know that that's how I operate in the world. I'm aware of there's a point I haven't gotten behind yet or beneath yet. And other people will see that differently, which is perfectly okay. And I find that other people see it differently more than okay because it provides the necessary contrast. Without contrast, you can't determine anything. It provides contrast for what I'm thinking and what I'm believing and how I'm feeling as opposed to what they're doing. And that enables us to move on. But I also believe, you dumb, that there is a place where there is no contrast. That would be maybe in our windows, um, thinking super mind or whatever that is. But that that mind or whatever it is said, it might be neat. I'm going to say it in casual terms. It might be neat to see what difference is like. And so we make difference. And it makes difference. And we deal with the difference. That we stumble all over that day in and day out. Well, okay, well, that's just, to me, that's part of getting up in the morning and going to bed at night. But I sense that behind that difference, there is a unity. And that unity is significant enough to me to want to pursue it further. No more, no less. And that's why we all tell our, our stories to each other. And I'm glad that we do. And as far as I'm concerned, too many people rely on other people's stories other than their own. Just tell your own story. It will turn out, I believe, pretty much like others because there's no other way to go. Without disagreeing with you, Ed, um, because I don't about the story issue, yeah. Um, one of the things about stories is interesting is that uh, we, um, you know, without saying it's neurological or only neurological, um, the way we access memory. So, you know, you can think of it the way it, it, it doesn't have to be only that, but mm -hmm. the way a computer does, you have a random access memory. So you, you drop in to some location Mm -hmm. uh, through association, for instance. And then from that one memory, you sequence through a series of memories. And essentially, it's a story-like process. So story is built into the way we untangle memory. And so it, it, it's, you know, it's right in the bottom of who we are as human beings. I do disagree with you that we here and I mean maybe you do think first and feel later but no, I no, tend to feel first. first and think after no. um it's usually why I take time before I re respond why like when uh, Mark said when I came on what do you think and I said I need to listen mm -hmm. because I needed to form my feelings before I was willing to start to speak and I tend to do that. I tend to work from feeling, and it takes time. Yes, and I agree with you 100%. That, that's what the point I was trying to get across. Our feelings tell us what to think. We have to feel first. I, I believe that's the, the root of everything. Feel it first and get a, get a feel for what's going on and then engage. That's, that's step number two, if you will. So, There was a, a video Johnny posted. Um, Who? John, John Davis posted to one of the thre to one of the Aurobindo threads. It was a fellow walking through the woods and um, talking about the mind and body and mm -hmm. how the body has a language of its own. This we might say is the feeling language of feelings, but that there could be a disconnect, there could be a, a failure of communication between the body and the mind. Where I think per perhaps what you were saying, Ed, is that the mind or the thinking faculty uh, kind of you know runs. Uh, even though in a way that let's say is, is not in sync 
mm-hmm. with what the body is actually feeling. Uh, and this creates a kind of distortion uh, in, in the signal. Uh, and the idea is like to tune into your feelings that you're speaking out of, you're speaking through a synchrony. Um, synchrony is, uh, I don't know what to call it exactly, harmony mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. Of, of body and mind. But that can, that can exist because they're distinct. Because they're distinct in, 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 a, in a way. They're distinct. They're not separate. Right? You can't like, have the brain in the vat just communicating in abstract. <laughs> so the, the, but because of their distinctness, there's a possibility for dissociation between them. This is a, to, you know, Wilbur has come up. Uh, he has many use, useful and I think valuable insights. One of them is that there's a process of differentiation and then integration, but the differentiation in its kind of unhealthy or extreme forms can turn into dissociation. And so when that occurs, there needs to be a kind of reconciliation of integration of the dissociated aspect. You can also call it the shadow. You referred to that earlier, Mark, um, and bring it back into the kind of, you know, the, cur- the, organi- the, cur- the current of the, the whole organism. Uh, and I think that that's valuable because you could see how Say, if you take an issue like the um, <clears throat> development of modern rationality and science, that it, it specializes in, different, in, in examining, explaining differentiation, the differentiation that we witness in the, in the natural world. Taken to the extreme, it becomes a dissociation from the natural world because everything is divided up into you know, infinite, infinitesimal parts and a sense for the whole is lost. So... Uh, I think that that's um, I think that that's a useful I- insight because it affects how we communicate. Uh, and if if we're communicating as feeling and thinking beings, we're going to be able to address a more complete sort of spectrum than if we're merely talking from our heads uh, and not also from our hearts and bodies and our full organism. So that was good. Yeah. <laughs> This is a kind of tough talk. Mm-hmm. Feeling a little bit, a little bit uh, raw or something, <laughs> strained from it. Kind of riled me up a little bit, Mark. Mm-hmm. Of course, <laughs> that's what I do. Trigger <laughs> warning. <laughs> it did take us to interesting places, though. The discussion. Yes, it did. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. Let's have a topic for next week, though. Uh, are we are we at the end? We are. Yeah. Listen, I can come up with a topic every <laughs> single week to to screw with you guys' minds. <laughs> Maybe once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well. I'm at a loss at this point. Um, I guess another cafe has come and gone. And mm-hmm. um, I, 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 Doug, are, do you have, are you still there? We haven't heard from you in a while. I think he may be out of Wi-Fi range or something. Doug's cutting heads off of chickens. <laughs> I heard thunder and lightning. I heard some, some pretty violent mm-hmm. thunder. All right. Well, uh, yeah, this one was great, and and uh, that's uh, you know I I generally speaking, I the cafe should be open. You know, so much happens. Seems like a year happens between you know six seven days. Uh, and you guys are all deep into all this philosophical stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's the life we live. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I'd love it. So that's my opinion, that the cafe is a place where we talk about the life we live. We don't need 
But I can give you one every single week. I guarantee you that. All right. I, I would like to say that I think, um, I mean, I'm planning to invite some guests uh, for future future cafes. Um, there's a. I thought this would be a good time slot to maybe do some poetry. Mm-hmm. There's a, a writer who we we've um, who's been part of a couple of groups, the Peter Sluderdijk group, as well as the um, Soul Mountain group. She's from Jordan, and she offered to help translate um, the the poetry of an Iraqi poet. I, I'm not going to try to say his name right here, but she described it as sort of the the wasteland of in of Arabic, uh, and so I thought that would be an interesting topic. Uh, there's another writer who submitted a piece to Metapsychosis. Her name is Leanne Gabor, and uh, it's a piece of fiction that I thought was really delightful. It was fun. It was playful. It had physics in it, poetry, um, a kind of almost like group of friends who are having a uh, kind of relationship issues. Um, so I thought that would be fun. She specializes, she's, she's a psychologist and she specializes in creativity, actually. Mm-hmm. So I think that there'd be some interesting possibilities for discussion there. Um, and, you know, I, I, uh, um, I think that, you know, bringing in more diversity in just the conventional progressive terms of it would be a good idea in, for, and I, I think of cosmic diversity. Like I, I'm interested in all kinds of diversity, neurodiversity, uh, gender diversity, all kinds of diversity to me are very delightful. Uh, and, and to do that in a way that is kind of transpolitical would be interesting, I think, like for it not to reduce into the kind of cultural, the terms of the culture, you know, conflicts of the, the current day. That's kind of the needle I would like to thread. Um, but I think that there's an infinitude of topics that, that we could bring into the cafe, uh, and also people and energies and the, the, the admixtures of those energies, I think is part of what makes it interesting. And some of those are very intellectual and abstract and cerebral. And I think others could be a lot more about like real life, but I think where it's interesting is where they, where they intersect, where the kind of like, where, as far as our mind could go comes, you know, face to face with the the day to day of life. And that's, that's, I think, to me, the sweet spot of where the creative juice uh, is, and could be. So just I agree. I, I totally agree. Now, just monetize it. <laughs> yeah, I probably need help with that. Uh, I also you can leave me no. your apartment uh, when you know leave leave, <laughs> or you can invest. We we could uh, set up some stock uh, options uh, for you. Take it out of Facebook. Put it into Cosmos. <laughs> I do. I also felt that there were some practitioner kind of people that we could invite rather than um, of what of pra- what? T- practitioners. So I'm thinking like I have a friend who's a specialist of breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. I have another friend who's actually, he's a businessman who applies slaughtered spheres to his business practice. Mm -hmm. So those are people who have interesting cross currents to what we're doing, but they're, they're more practically focused than theoretically focused. Can they dialogue with us? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, All right. They have everyday lives. <laughs> <laughs> They're not academics. That's the mm-hmm. thing, you see. So mm-hmm. I think the practitioners is an interesting uh, element to bring in. But uh, Yeah, I think that sounds great. All right, well, I let's just... I always love to find out that there are people who are doing things in the world. I, I think I, that that part... I think is the most fascinating of all. You know, we can you can talk about stuff all you want, but I like people that are trying to do things. Mm. You know, all then, talk, no action. Well, you know, I, I have a very strong pragmatist streak. From, you know, being an American and whatnot. So, a lot of the things that you people consider as politically, I don't know, weird topics, 
they're, they're so, there's, a, there's a lot that goes on here that is just so American. It's uninteresting. Believe me. Yeah. You, you people have issues that the, the rest you of the world people, doesn't even think about. You yeah. people. You people, yeah. Yeah, you people. That's how, that's how it comes across, you know. Yeah. It's just, I heard it's, something today. On, I was listening to the Weird Studies podcast with uh, J.F. Mortel and Phil Ford, and they were talking about... Um, uh, oh gosh, I just lost. <laughs> they were talking about William James and the question, an essay, on the consciousness. Uh, called, what What is consciousness? And uh, but he made a comment about Canadians. I, I didn't realize that Canadians. And this is what he said. Mm-hmm. I'm just reporting. Yeah, yeah. For have a have a have a whole superiority complex with respect to Americans. Of course. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and rightfully it's, so. It's, it's so. It's so well, so well camouflaged in in the yeah. humility and politeness yeah. and so forth. That, that's the main reason I haven't been speaking here right now. I'm not Canadian, but I I hold that complex with it. You were dying. You yeah. identify with them. Who <laughs> who doesn't have a superiority complex? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm above that. Sounds like a good topic for next week, huh? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's call it a day then. That's, that's good. Thank you all. Night. Thank you more. All. Yep. <laughs> okay. Ciao. Enjoyed. Take care. See you next time.